everyone has heard people quarreling. They say things like this, How'd you like it if anyone did the same to you? That's my seat, I was there first. Leave him alone, he isn't doing you any harm. Why should you go first? Give me a bit of your orange, I gave you a bit of mine. Come on, you promised. People say things like that every day. Educated people as well as uneducated, and children as well as grown-ups. Now, what interests me about all these remarks is that the people who make them are not merely saying that the other person's behavior does not happen to please them. He is appealing to a standard of behavior which they expect the other person to know about. And the other person very seldom replies, to hell with your standard. Everyone believes in right and wrong. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life, into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the Psalms. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to Psalm 120 as we join their discussion. The words Brian read were first spoken by C.S. Lewis on the radio and then written in his book, Mere Christianity. Here, Lewis is arguing that our universal desire for justice is evidence that we were created by a moral God and that his moral nature has been stamped on our souls. I'm Kent Edwards, and Vicki Hitzkiss and Nathan Norman are joining me today. And folks, I, I'm wondering, do you think C.S. Lewis is right? Do you think all people everywhere, young and old, educated and uneducated, do all people believe in right and wrong? Yeah, I think so. I think everyone has some sort of innate understanding of what is right and wrong. Now, if they agree on what is right and wrong, that's a different question. <laughs> yeah, and C.S. Lewis in his book goes on to talk about there, of course, are differences, but somewhat minor differences. But the basic understanding of you can't do that, that's wrong, mm -hmm. this is the way things must be done, does seem to exist uh, across cultures. Can you think of some examples of where people have demonstrated this in everyday life? Well, if your employer has agreed to pay you a certain amount and they don't pay you a certain amount, yep. <laughs> everyone universally says that's wrong. I'm in an HOA and we all expect the board to do what it says in the bylaws. And if they don't, everybody gets upset. Um, when I go grocery shopping, I sometimes check my receipt to make sure they charged me what the sale price was. And if they don't, I go back and go, hey. <laughs> <laughs> or if they double charged you, right? Yeah, whatever. It needs to be what I expected to pay. Yeah, we um, as we record this podcast, um, a strike is just ending with car manufacturers by their union workers. And the union workers are saying, hey, since the pandemic the, is finished, the uh, Compensation for the CEOs has gone up a uh, hundredfold. And we as workers, we want to be compensated the same. We need to also have an increase. It's not fair for only you to benefit from increasing profits, not us. I mean, that's one of the basic beliefs that underline our law courts, isn't it? We need to be treated fairly. I find it interesting when you look at the uh, logo of Lady Justice, most of our listeners may have seen that. It's a, it's a woman standing in the midst of a, it looks like an olive leaf and uh, holding a sword, which represents justice. But Lady Justice is standing with a blindfold on and a scale in her hand that is equal. No, Lady Justice represents fairness. And in a good court, that's where both sides of the dispute present their evidence, and they are judged by the evidence, and everyone is treated fairly. Now, we take comfort in knowing, in court at least, where we will be treated fairly. But it doesn't always work that way in everyday life, especially for the people of God. We see this in Psalm 120. Nathan, this Psalm 120 is given a title. What is it to... What does that mean? 
It's a song of ascent. So this is a song you're singing while you're on your way to worship up in Jerusalem. Hmm. And, uh, and no matter where you are in Israel, you're always going up to Jerusalem. So it's not a north-south kind of thing. You're always going up. You're always going towards it. And when you leave Jerusalem, you're going down from Jerusalem, whether you're heading north, south, east, or west. So as they're heading on their way to worship in Jerusalem, how does this song in Psalm 120, how does this song begin, Vicki? It says, I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. Woo. So the psalmist is saying there he's being verbally attacked. Why? What does he say in verses 5 and following? He says, Woe to me that I dwell in Meshach, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Ooh. Woe to me because I dwell in what? Meshach. Meshach. Well, the obvious question to me is, where in the world is Meshach? <laughs> And I found it interesting that it is far northwest of Israel, an actual place. It's referred to in Ezekiel chapter 32, where the prophet mentions uh, Meshach um, as part of Egypt's condemnation. They are so bad, God will judge them so severely that they will join uh, Egypt's punishment and will dwell in Sheol with other uncircumcised barbarians. What's shield? Uh, that's the grave. So it is the abode of the dead. Uh, in fact, Ezekiel goes on to say in chapter 38 and 39, the people of Meshach represent all the anti-God forces in the world who are maliciously bent on destroying God's people. Yikes. So here is a worshiper of God living in anti-God society, right? Mm -hmm. And he wants peace. He wants to live at peace. And they, his neighbors, hate him. He's living in a caustic environment. But not only is he dwelling in Meshach, I live among the tents of Kedar. Kedar? Hmm. Well, that's an actual nation that was a nomadic tribe that lived in tents in the Syrio Arabian desert, way down in the south. And Isaiah announced that God would destroy them utterly in Isaiah chapter 21 and all of their grandeur. Again, an anti-God nation. So I'm not sure if the psalmist actually did live in both these towns that are so far apart, or he's just saying that his environment, wherever he is, is as bad as these people are. He is a righteous man living among unrighteous people. Think of the tension that would bring. I've felt like that before. I've told people about the Lord and had them. One was a radio talk show host and one was a columnist for the morning news. And they they have attacked me in public. And um, that does not feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think about uh, people who are, married to an unbelieving spouse and i have one person in mind uh, her husband is very antagonistic towards christianity and to the point where we're at funerals multiple funerals over the years and every conversation i will have with him is him trying to take a jab at us and at our beliefs and ridicule 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 and i only have to deal with that you know once every six months kind of thing uh his wife has to deal with that day in, day out, every time she goes to a church function. I don't know why you're spending your time serving these people and helping these people. It's hard. Yeah. That seems like an odd time for him to attack at a funeral. <laughs> He's an odd guy. <laughs> yeah. He's a very odd guy. <laughs> I, I, I have a really precious friend who's Jewish. And, you know, obviously she does, she believes what Jews believe. She, she doesn't believe in Jesus and heaven and all that. But she has said to me, um, I envy Christians who believe in heaven and that they have hope for the future. And which is why I say that's an odd time for him to attack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Jewish people who are on their way to worship God in Jerusalem are lamenting the fact of how they are being treated 
by unbelievers around them. They're victims of lies and misrepresentation, slander, living among people who are hostile to their faith, who hate them because of their faith. Nathan, Vicki, we live in America and we have been called um, as a Christian nation. Certainly, there's a strong Christian influence in America even today. Um, but imagine what it's like for some of our listeners who may live in India or Iran. Think of the kind of accusations and poor treatment they'd be receiving. In India, our crosstalk students tell us that the Hindu National Party defines being Indian as being Hindu. So to be a Christian is to be against the nation. Um, they tell me that when they live in an apartment building, when neighbors begin to find out that they are Christians, because of course, as Christians, they gossip the gospel, they, they live righteous lives as well. But when the neighbors begin to find out that their faith, it's not long before the landlord will evict them. Oh. Mm. And they have to leave and relocate and their children have to change schools. And it, they live in a hostile environment, not because they're not righteous, but because they are godly, because they love Christ. In Iran, similar things. You can't be an Iranian unless you are Muslim. What is going on here? Christians are persecuted. They experienced what the psalmist was experiencing. And Jesus warned us that, right? Didn't he warn us about this in his Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes? You remember how that went? Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn and meek. He gives a description of true godliness. But how does it end? What's the last blessed in that uh, Matthew passage? It says, blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Wow. So that is the natural result, uh, Jesus is saying, of right. being a and, godly person. And Jesus even said in the Gospel of John, don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me first, and no servant is greater than his master. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but does that feel right? If you're living in Iran, if you're living in India, if you're living anywhere and facing this natural result of hostility that non-Christians have to Christians, does it seem right? Does it seem just? No. No, it's completely unfair. And, you know, I, and a lot of the isolation we feel in this country, which obviously isn't as big as in, say, Iran and, and other places, Indonesia, but every time you turn on a movie and anything about God or Christianity is mentioned, right? The Christian character is either a psychopathic <laughs> murderer or an idiot, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you can't be a mastermind evil person and an idiot simultaneously. You have to be one or the other, but, but no, we're, we're one or the other. And, uh, and that's hard because story after story, as we believe in crosstalk, story is the universal language. Mm -hmm. So if you're exposed to story after story saying that you are evil, for trusting in Christ, or you are an idiot for trusting in Christ, that starts that starts to wear on you. That does feel like a form of psychological warfare. Yeah, because we're being attacked by lying lips and deceitful tongues, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. We certainly are. <laughs> and I, I struggle even a bit more when I remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, when he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And even more, Romans 12, verse 17, look at what he says. He says, don't repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, this sounds like Paul saying be a patsy, right? <laughs> Well, like, act, actively be a patsy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that, oh, doesn't my goodness. Seem, but that doesn't seem right. How can God allow evil to triumph? I mean, isn't his very nature righteousness? Yeah, but but he did that. I, I think about Jesus being on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them. Here he is. He's broken. He's wounded. He's bleeding. And, and instead of going zap and killing every one of them, he's like, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Uh, yeah, I just... Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Hmm. This is the angst the pilgrim felt on the way to Jerusalem. He's been constantly treated as the enemy by his neighbors. 
He's acted as a dove among hawks and been rewarded with hatred and prejudice. And if C.S. Lewis is right, and there is a universal understanding of right and wrong, and there is, and if he's right that the morality that is baked into the human heart comes from the God who created everyone and everything, and it does, how can a moral God allow evil to triumph? Ah, but the answer is, he won't. Remember his prayer? I call on the Lord in my distress, and he, what? He answers me. Yeah. When he prayed, when the man on the way to Jerusalem prayed, save me, Lord, from lying lips and deceitful tongues, what is God's answer? What answer did God give him? He says, what will he do to you? And what more besides you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with the warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom bush. Woo. What is the answer God gave? Justice will come. It may not be here today, but it is coming. And when he comes, it'll come with sharp arrows and burning coals. <laughs> the sharp arrows talk about what? Death. And burning coals? What judgment. is that reminiscent of? Eternal judgment. Eternal judgment, almost like a lake of fire, right? Mm. There is hell to pay for unrighteousness, and God will bring it. If not today, it is certainly coming because he is a just God and a holy God. And that's why even in Romans, in the midst of telling us to not repay evil with evil, he pointed out in verse 19 and following. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take for revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Oof. As hard as it might be in the present. As Christians, we are not to take revenge on those who attack us because of our faith. God is calling us to turn the other cheek, knowing that the justice we want and that we deserve will come, but it will come in his time and from his hand. And when we do that, people will see Christ in us. Won't they, Vicki? I think that's true. I remember hearing a story when I was following you here, Kent, of a soldier who was a Christian, and he was mm -hmm. getting mocked and scorned in his barracks. And he stayed up one night to polish his boots. And the other soldiers were making fun of him and belittling him. And he just quietly kept on shining his boots. And the next morning, all the soldiers who had mocked him's boots were shined. Hmm. And to make a long story short, they became believers because they were so ashamed of what they had done. Yeah. Wow. Jesus suffered mistreatment and persecution at the hands of evil people, didn't he? Oh, yeah. He did. And he did not fight back. When Peter tried with the sword, Jesus stopped him. But Jesus will return one day, this time on a war horse, to bring justice, the justice that righteous people deserve and that we are waiting for. I think it's helpful when we face the persecution that all Christians face, just like this godly Jew on his way to Jerusalem. For us to remember what Moses said in Exodus chapter 37. The Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Amen. You can bet that if you represent Christ, at some time you will be attacked for your witness. But we have confidence that God will seek vengeance on those who have hurt us because of our faith. I trust that today's discussion of God's word has been helpful and serve as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's word to life, to our lives this week. 
The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also help support this show by sharing it on your social media and telling your friends. Tune in next Friday as we continue our discussion through the Psalms. Be sure to join us. 